14. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They went up to this demon-possessed guy and said, I adjure you in the name of the God that Paul talks about. And they said, we don't know who you are. Go on to 16. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That was seven guys and one evil spirit. That word prevailed is exactly the same as the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That prevailed is the same word. There's power in that word. The seven sons got whooped and sent away naked because that enemy had more power than they did. They weren't aware of the power and the authority in a righteous person. They were just aware that they saw this man Paul do something and they didn't have it in them. They just knew of the power, but they didn't implement it for themselves. That's kind of like giving a four-year-old, actually a two-year-old, a 45. They got no idea, and they can hurt themselves just as bad as they could hurt somebody else. And that's what these seven sons did. They got a hold of this big gun, and they started, and it, and it whooped them. And they left wounded and hindered and hurt. Then go, to, um, <laughs> then go on down in that same one. Go down to verse 20. And then it talks about the Word of God. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. That's that same word as availeth. Go to Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do is the same word. That's the same word as availeth much. I just wanted you to see it in some other sentence. We're working with Caleb on his words. And so he's spelling and we're like, make, go make a sandwich. So that he hears it. And then he sees it in a sentence that makes it under, that lets you understand it better. And when I was reading it, the Lord kept bringing me back to it because I didn't have an understanding of how much authority and power was actually in that one word. I had read it, I don't know how many times, that a righteous person's prayers have power and have authority, but I had no idea of how much that was. I was listening to a guy talk, and he was talking about trillions and how we've got no concept of what a trillion or 17 trillion, whatever our deficit is in the nation, we have no concept of what that is. And so he broke it down for a way for somebody like me, I can understand it. He said, if you do numbers, dollars, one number, one dollar every second. One, two, three, four, five... It's impossible. When you get to $999,999.99, whenever you get to there, you can't do that in one second. But if you could talk really, really fast, it would take you 500,000 years to count one a second to where somewhere in the ballpark of our deficit. You see, we talk about trillions like we understand it. We talk about it in, in numbers like it makes sense, like we have this grasp of it. I had no clue that was what it was. That number was so much bigger than any fathom of my imagination that whenever I found out at a second, a dollar, it was going to take 500,000 plus years just to count to it. That number became huge to me. Well... That's exactly the way this word is growing in me. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It has so much more power, so much more authority than what my mind had wrapped around it. 
I can do all things. How many of you have quoted that? Did you know how much power there was in that? There was power, just one event of seven guys to get beat up by one guy just because of a, a demented power, a demented version of the God kind of power. And he beat up seven guys and sent them away whining and whimpering naked. That's power. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're jumping. <laughs> Do you guys remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came to get Jesus? The power that came about at that time. Go to John chapter 18. I'm going to attempt to stay to where I can at least find where my scriptures are. John 18. Actually, let's go with a different route. Let's go to Matthew 26, 47 first. I want you to see that first. I think it will help you. Matthew 26 and 47. This is Jesus in the garden when they're coming to arrest him. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. So many times we picture Jesus being arrested by four or five soldiers and the high priest guy. Because the enemy wants you to think that. He wants you to think there wasn't very many people there. Because the Word of God shows some cool stuff when you look at it. So, a great multitude. Now, we know a few other times that the Bible uses a great multitude. When Jesus fed the 5,000, they called that a great multitude. That was 5,000 men, not counting women and children and old men. It was basically 5,000 men of fighting age that would have been able to be able to serve in the military. Fit, 5,000 men. That was a great multitude. This word says that when they came to arrest Jesus, there was a great multitude. And then if you go to John chapter 18... Verse 6. Back up one. Let's go to five. They answered him, Jesus said, who do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am, and he's in italics, it's added by the King James authors. I am is what Jesus said. What did God tell Moses? Who sent you? Just tell him, I am sent you. So Jesus said, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them, verse 6. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am, they went backward and they fell to the ground. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but this great multitude of soldiers fell out at the word of Jesus. They were slain in the spirit by the power of God coming out of a man, Jesus. And it was a great multitude. If you look at, listen to Rick Renner, there had to be somewhere around 600 armed Roman soldiers to go out in a band called like this. When a band of soldiers goes out, it can't be over that. And it has to be within 50 or 60 of that. So they can't go out unmanned and be less in number. And they can't go out over that or it uses a different term and a different word. So hundreds of Roman soldiers armed the best that there was in the land at that time. They, Jesus said, who do you seek? They said, we're coming here and we're going to get Jesus and we're taking him to jail. And he goes, I am. And they all fell out. Armor laying everywhere on the ground. 
soldiers trying to figure out what ran over and what hit them. <laughs> Go on one more verse. Then he asked them again, who do you seek? And they said, um, Jesus, are you him? They had a whole different attitude. See, this mob came out, and I don't know if you've ever been around them. Um, <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Um, God makes you tell some of the weirdest things. Glory to God. If you ever bounce in a bar, you're probably going to see a mob. Now, they're not mild-mannered. They get all hyped up and going, and they get an idea in their head, and this one talks to that one, and it gets bigger, and they join this one, and that one joins that one. And the feeding frenzy on that rebellion and on that mob grows and grows and grows to the point you had 60 or 70 mild-mannered guys come in to drink and to dance and to do whatever, and all of a sudden, now you've got 50 guys excited and bent on causing havoc because of the generation of that excitement and that rebellion. Well, you have hundreds, a great multitude, minimum of 100, hundreds of soldiers. So 600, 700 soldiers. Then you've got the great multitude of all these people that see the soldiers going to arrest somebody and they're ambulance chasing so now you got all these other people, and they're talking to them on the way. Who are you going to get? What are you going to do? Who are you going to? Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I didn't like him from the beginning. I just never liked him. I want to be right with you. And now you've got all of this mob walking through this area and this region, and people are gathering. And so when they got there, they were bold, and they were outnumbered. They had the, all these numbers, and Jesus' group, they were outnumbered. They knew there was only a few of them. And so they come out, and they said, Jesus, we're going to get you. And he says, I am, and they fall out. And that power that went out changed them. When they came back up, he goes, now, who do you seek? Now they're polite. Well, sir, we came here after you. If it'd be all right, would you join us, and we'll take you in nice and calm. Nobody's going to lay a hand on you. It'll be okay. You know, just don't hurt us anymore. You see, their whole demeanor changed. Go on to the next verse. I have told you that I am he, and if therefore you seek me, let these go their way. You see, the power of God didn't work on Jesus' behalf. Yes, it would have. But Jesus saw this mob. And he knew this mob was going to run over anybody in their way. And he knew his disciples loved him. Peter had already told him, I'm going to die. And Jesus told him, no, you're going to, you're going to turn away from me and deny me. And I think he was built up. I don't care what happens. I'm, I'm getting somebody. If they come after my Jesus, he already told me I'm going, to be, I'm going to deny him. And I am not going to deny him. I am not going to deny him. And so he's going through this and he's built himself up. And Jesus knows it. And so Jesus is going, we got to do something. This mob is going to run over and hurt all of my kids. God told me, my dad, I'm giving you these. Don't lose any of them. Because later on, he gives a report. All of them but Judas are safe and sound. And so when this mob comes, Jesus steps up and he, with everything in him says, I am. And they fall out. And then he asked them again just to see how their temperament was. Oh, yeah, that's acceptable. Well, I'm he, but leave these guys alone. And had he not done that, I'm sure they would have said, well, we're taking all of you. We're going to lock you. Maybe you, you guys may not even make it to jail. We're going to kill all of you on the way because we, we only need this Jesus. Now, I don't know what their plans were, but they all got foiled when they fell out. And now Jesus in power and authority says, leave my people alone. You let them go their way. See, that's power. That's true power. Power to be able to speak and it come to pass. Go to Mark 14. Mark 
14 and 51. And there followed him. This is after Jesus said, I am. And they all fell out in the spirit. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast around his naked body. And the young man and the young men laid hold on him. Verse 52. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now why does God have that in there? How many of you knew the naked boy was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus when he was arrested? Why is that in there? We're talking about the power of God. This power that laid thousands of people out at the word of Jesus. Garden of Gethsemane is a graveyard. The rich and the powerful people have their tombs around the garden. And a linen cloth, if you look the word up, is a burial garment. This particular one is made in Egypt, a fine linen. It's the same linen that Jesus himself was buried with. It was a fine linen. And so this boy had died. And he was naked with a burial garment wrapped around him, laid up in a tomb in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus spoke and the power of God went out, that boy was raised from the dead. And he ran away naked and the soldiers tried to get him. Probably because how would you want to arrest somebody that just raised one of the rich guy's kid from the dead? Well, you wouldn't want that getting out. We arrest him. What for? Well, he raised this rich guy's kid from the dead. Why else wouldn't we arrest him? You can't go and speak against a man. The wealthy people of that region buried their dead there. And this young man got raised from the dead and they told the soldiers to grab him. And when they did, he slipped out of that burial garment and he fled naked because the power of God moved on that place. That same power of God that we're talking about. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He gave all of his righteous people the power that Jesus had in the garden. Go to John chapter 14. Fourteen and twelve. This is Jesus. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Then shortly after that, immediately after that verse, he talks about the comforter coming. And then in verse 26, he talks about the comforter coming. And then on down in uh, 16 and 7, he talks about the comforter coming. He immediately says, this power that I have, that my Father gave me, I'm giving to you. Go into the world. Preach the good news. Heal the sick. Cause the blind to see. All of this stuff you've seen me do, you now have the ability to do. Because I'm sending this comforter. If you look that word up, it means one of the same. You see, Jesus had this difficulty in a human body. He couldn't be with every person individually at the same time. But you see, this comforter God sent us is the same in likeness with Jesus. But he has the ability to be in all of us at one time on an individual basis. And the power that Jesus operated in on the earth in a human form was from the Spirit of the Lord that descended upon him as a dove and came upon him, and then he walked it out the way Adam 
would have walked it out in the garden. And then once the fall of man happened, our minds got construed different to where we didn't understand we had power. We didn't understand we had authority. We had no concept of how much our prayer can avail, how strong it is. And so over a period of time, we started joking and teasing and and saying stuff that we didn't mean And God had to draw that power back or we were going to hurt ourselves. Sometimes, you know, we talk about wondering about weird things. I often wondered, what happened while the power was still up and somebody joked? (laughs) You're just an idiot. Immediately, that person would have became an idiot. Because the power of God was still turned up. So I wonder how many mishaps really happened (laughs) before the power got dumbed down because God had to back it up at some point because everything we spoke should have came to pass. Little things that I think of once in a while. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. This is, uh, <laughs> this is one of those things that I'm so believing we get a hold of and grasp. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come... And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the comer thereunto perfect. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? In other words, if they didn't remember their sin, would they remember to make an offering? Because the worshiper once purged would have no more conscience of sins. So he's saying in the Old Testament, if God would have pulled all of that consciousness of sin away, they'd have forgot about him. They wouldn't have made offerings for their sin and they'd have died and been lost in their sin because the payment of Jesus' blood had not yet been paid. And so they would have got away from God and died in their sin and their name would have been blotted out of the Lamb's book of life because they died in their sin. But as it was, they made sacrifices over and over, year after year, year after year, year after year, just to cover it until the perfect sacrifice came. And so they all died with their sins covered. But then Jesus went to hell and he brought out everybody out of Abraham's bosom and he brought them back out because their sins had been covered until the full atonement, the redemption of the blood of Jesus was fulfilled. And that's what he's saying. If they wouldn't have had the consciousness of sin, so it was necessary is what I'm getting at. The consciousness of sin was necessary in our lives back then. He's saying if you'd have forgot about your sin, you'd have got away from me and died in it. We don't need that consciousness anymore. God's within us. The Holy Spirit resides in us. We don't need to be sin conscious anymore. We need to realize, yeah, if we mess up, we've got to repent for it. It's plain and simple. But we don't have to grovel and ask and plead and beg. We have to understand. It's just like Caleb or Ryan or Jessica when they were little and they did something wrong, they'd come and go, and their whole demeanor changed when they walked to you. You could see them a mile away and know they messed up. Because they usually just run up, hi, Dad, I don't know, and 90 mile an hour. And all of a sudden they're like... And the closer they get, the lower and the slower and the less eye contact you got. And if you could move over, they'd walk right by you because they're not looking at you at all anymore. 
Because they're going, oh man, I gotta go to dad. Okay. Well, that's what we do with God when we are sin conscious. And you see, as a child, they come and they go, I slapped Ryan and I did this and I did that and I didn't mean to. It just, my arm just uncontrollably slapped him. Well, as soon as you look at him and go, thank you, that's okay. You go apologize to him, it'll be okay. Well, they walk over and they go, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's over. The next time you see him, hi, Dad, what you doing? They, they forgot about that. That whole event is gone in their mind. They're back to being jubilant, happy, no consciousness of anything ever happening wrong. They're right back in, in the middle of everything you're doing. What you doing? What is that? How does that work? How do you do that? Why'd you do that? Where's that go? How come we're over here? Where are we going? What time are we going to eat? They have no consciousness that they can bother you, that they can make you mad, that they can offend you. They don't. Why? There's no condemnation. They come to you plainly and cleanly thinking, man, dad's got all the answers. We'll ask him anything. He's got the best ones. So then they just barrage you with all of this stuff because they haven't a care about what you think because they know you love them. They know they're in right standing with you. And so they ask for anything. Dad, I saw a Maserati a minute ago. Can I get one of those? I'd like mine in red with convertible top. They have no concept of it. We laugh because we have a concept of it, and we immediately, the enemy has us thinking, well, yeah, you, man, your job won't get that, and you can't get that. You don't even know anybody that's probably got the money to go get. And you're doing analysis of it. You're not just laughing. You're laughing because for you, it's an impossible thing. Got quiet, didn't it? Because we see it as something unattainable. So we laugh because we don't want to cry. Because the enemy has got this sin consciousness in us, this control of us, beating us down, saying, you can only go so far. Who told the waves where they stop? God did. Who told the sun when to shine? God did. Who controls what you have? God does by your mouth. So whenever the enemy gets you beat down and thinking, man, I just can't ever get that. I just can't. That's just him. God gave Jesus to us. He gave us Jesus. The son that was already at his right hand. The son that was with him when God looked at the earth and it was void and blank and black. And he said, let there be light. And it was. When he said, split the infirmament, I want stars over here. I want a moon over here. I'd like to have water here with a little island with a few palm trees on it. Jesus was there with him. He gave that up for you and I. How much more would he be happy for everybody in the parking lot out here to have a Maserati convertible? Whatever color you want. You buy it off the lot and you don't like the wheels, so you send it back and you put another $40,000 worth of new wheels and tires on. You don't like the color, so you send it out and you have it etched with something you do like. And you have it whatever color you want because God would give you anything. The desires of your heart is what the Word says. Because he paid the price. He loves you this much. By the way, that's the title of this message. Part two. Don't know that I've ever done that one before, so part two. He loves you this much. And just as a child comes to mom and dad and said, when you walk through the grocery store, they want everything that's in there. They got no use for it. They don't know if they like it. I want one of those. I want one of those. I want one of those. 
Can we put one of those? And if you ride them in there in their little seat and you swing by, your cart fills up fast. <laughs> You'll be pushing along going, how do we get all the... <laughs> I wanted it. All of this stuff can bail in your cart. Why can't that be the same with God? Why can't we walk through life going, oh, man, look at that. And God goes, hey, go to that next corner. I'll show you a picture of one see if you really like it. You see, I think that's why God shows us stuff. There's a particular car that I really liked. For my size, Lamborghinis, all of those, not so much. I tried to get, we, Dan and I went, I tried to get in a Lamborghini. You have to disassemble my body to get it in a Lamborghini. So then it was a challenge. We need to find a sports car that Rob can fit in. So we went and looked at different ones and there's a sports car that's awesome. I fit in it, it runs real good. The doors go when you close them. You know, when you close the door, it goes clink. These go It's nice. Man. You ever watch uh, Charlie Chapman? How did the blind guy know the rich car pulled up? That baffled me for a long time until I went and saw Rolls Royce. I've heard doors close my whole life. Clunk, clack, clink, ring. <laughs> you walk up and you open a Rolls and you go, I'm standing in the showroom, <laughs> Dan's over there laughing at me. I'm going, Phew. <laughs> Phew. I do it, I don't know how many times. Finally, the sales guy comes over, he goes, they close good, don't they? <laughs> you notice that. <laughs> That's why he knew. It was the sound of a quality machine that the door closed on. You see, when the enemy gets you beat down, you don't even want to look at those things. You don't even want to think about it because it's so unattainable in your mind that you won't allow yourself to hear it and see it because it's disappointing. Many times with sickness and disease in our bodies, it's the same thing. The enemy gets you beat down and says, well, this, your lungs are bad because you smoked five packs a day for this many years. Man, you sow it, you're going to reap it. No. I sowed sin my whole life before I came to God. I'm not reaping a dime of it. I'm going to heaven. I don't have to go to hell for all the junk I did. I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to know anything about any of that. That is the plan of God. You see, the enemy wants you beat down. He wants you thinking you deserve what you got. He wants you thinking that you can't have any better. You can't gain. And the Bible says we go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. We can move up. You can go back. We, uh, we move from glory to glory. And so as we move, we get to see different things. You see, God's showing me this car all the time. It's so great. I drive down the road. I pointed it out to the kids. I was like, look at that. That is a sweet car. And then I probably didn't see one of those cars ever six months for the last two years. And in the last couple of weeks, actually the last week, we've seen them three times. I'm going, glory to God, getting closer all the time. <laughs> it's like God just renews that vision. Have you ever, when you have a godly vision... Everything in you feels like, man, that's nice. From here, not in your head, not going, oh, look, I'd be cool. Right? <laughs> From in here, there's something about it that God's trying to go, I got that for you. Hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. I got it. And then you get down, all of a sudden, that particular vision or that something that reminds you of that comes back. That's God going, I still got it for you. Stay in there. I still got it for you. You're going to get it. 
Hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Hang in there. Keep that vision. The Word of God says without a vision, His people will perish. So we got to keep that going. If there's sickness in your body, keep the vision of you being healed and whole. If there's sickness in your mind, keep the vision of the sanity and go decision to decision to decision in a sanity thought. Don't let your mind run away with you. Don't let him get you thinking other junk. It's the same thing. If it's finances, look ahead. Be content wherever you are is what Paul said. But you don't have to be satisfied where you are. You can always be looking out, looking ahead, but be content in the current state. But look for more. As a dad, my kids are at this level. When I look at them, I want them farther on. I'm not going to be offended if God opens a door for them to move to the next level. Why? That would, I wouldn't be a very good dad. So why would God be upset if you move to a whole nother level? A whole nother tax bracket? A whole nother parking lot or house or place? He wouldn't. He loves you so much. He made you righteous. He gave you power. Your prayers avail much. He gave you the ability to speak and it come to pass. Dan was reading that uh, renewing our mind. It's an ongoing thing, but it's one of the most important things in your walk with God. Renewing your mind with the Word of God. You see, we here, I grew up in a denominational church, and I love those people dearly. I know more about the Old Testament because we did quizzes. We did events. We had to know the Bibles. We had to know all the songs. You guys all know the books of the Bible by song? There's a song for the Old Testament. There's a song for the New Testament. And you had to be able to sing the song and know all of the, ver all of the books. And you had to be able to know all of the characters. And so whenever somebody talks about Nadab and Abihu or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or all of these different people, we had them in quiz bowls. We had to know them inside and out. We had races every service to see who could get to the Bible chapter the quickest. You turn there and you raise your hand and I always let somebody else beat me because I don't want to read. I could get there and go, I oh, missed it by just a little bit. Go ahead. So they taught us all of this stuff. But at the same time, there was doctrinal stuff that was ingrained in us that it takes me time to get past. That you don't deserve this. That God only does this for these people. He only does this for those people. That, you know... <laughs> that money only comes to the head pastor. <laughs> he said, servant is worthy as hire, and you're just, you're just a helper. Um, you know, there's all of this stuff that comes from doctrinal junk that you have to get past. You know, um, a friend of mine came to the Lord, hadn't been around church at all, grew up just a heathen, came to the Lord, walked in, had none of that indoctrinal stuff. He doesn't have to deal with a lot of the junk in, that goes on in my head about so-and-so saying this should have happened and so-and-so saying that should have happened and, oh, you can't deserve this and you don't deserve that. And you've got all of these voices from people you trusted and you loved that came over a pulpit at some point. They do the best they know. But, oh, Lord, we, me, all of us know so little that we're all trying to grow up and we're all trying to get to this other place. And you've got to renew your mind away from that. I was listening to one of the first services in the Branson church from Brother Moore the last couple of days. And that was when they were talking about where's the scripture. Well, yeah, I just think this and this and this. Well, where's the scripture? Well, I just believe this and this and this. Well, where's the scripture? And uh, 
There's so many of those things we've got to get our mind renewed to. We've got to be able to get back to the Word of God. Because if Junior tells me something that's direct Word of God, I got no option but to believe it. It doesn't matter what our past is, what's happened, where it is. If it's the Word of God, for me it's infallible. I have to believe it. There's a bumper sticker out that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's completely wrong. God said it and it's settled. Whether you believe it or not doesn't really matter. It's still settled. Now we want you to believe it. But it's settled before, during, and after the time that you believe it. Because God said it and it's established. We have power in our words. I don't know where we ended up with all of that. But we have power in what we say. And God set us up. And so many times we as Christians, we're praying for stuff that God gave us authority over. I've got a black lab. Caleb actually has a black lab. That uh, his name's Bo. And whenever Bo's doing something I don't like, I go, I don't go, oh, Bo, could you please? No, I have authority. When I go, Bo, sit, he sits. If he's doing something and the kids go, Bo, quit, Bo, quit, Bo, quit, Bo, quit, Bo, quit, Bo, quit doing that, Bo, quit, Bo, quit. I go, Bo. I don't have to tell him quit. He's heard it 15 times. He already knows the thought. He's just waiting for the authority to come into play to respond. It's the same with you. God gave you power. Don't pray for things he gave you authority in. How many of you know the life of Jesus is our plan, our example? We're supposed to walk it out. Remember Peter's mother-in-law? She was sick of a fever. Jesus walked in. He said, oh, God, please heal her. If it's your will, could you please come down and just touch her? Lay your hand upon her. Touch her. Heal her, Lord. No. He said, fever, get out. The word says he rebuked it, and it immediately left. She got up and ministered to him. Why? Jesus had authority. He was righteous, and his prayer availed much to the point that that power that the Word's talking about in prayer, He gave us rule and dominion. Adam had dominion over everything that happened. So much so, he called a cow a cow and it started mooing. And today, when we look at a cow, we call it what Adam called it. Because of the Word that prevailed out of a man of God. Not... This, not the quote-unquote religious son of God that's deity that we can never attain. Jesus himself, we just read in John 14 and 12, he said, whatever I've done, you're going to be able to do more. I'm going to go to my Father. I'm going to stand there and make sure it comes to pass exactly the way you said. We don't have time to go into it for a moment, but over and over and over in the Scripture, it talks about God makes the words of his servants come to pass. When you speak it, He watches over it. He makes it come to pass. That's the power of God in our life. When we see something and we speak death and dying, we receive death and dying. But when we line up our words with the Word of God and we speak life, Jesus is over there going, Dad, Dad, did you see that? <laughs> They're growing up. Go ahead. And it really is. It's like a little kid learning to walk. When they get up, yeah, they're going to fall. But if they get one step up and then they fall, you praise them for the one step. And you encourage them to get back up and try it again. And the religious organizations now, you get one step and they're already griping about it. And when you fall, they're telling you not to get up. Y'all, no, 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 we're not supposed to do that. Don't lay hands on the sick. That was those guys. Don't pray for that. That was those other guys. That's not the Word of God. Where is the Scripture for that? Jesus said believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He told them, go into all the world, preach the good news. I'm sorry, if I'm sick and the good news is I'm going to stay sick, I don't like your news. 
I want the good news. I'm getting out. I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger. I'm moving forward. My life, has, God has a good plan for me. A good plan isn't sickness and death. A good plan is going over, coming out, and taking all your family and friends with you so you've got thousands upon thousands of years to enjoy what God gave us right here and to walk in it. You see, Jesus spoke to the demons. He didn't pray the Father to rebuke and move the demons out. He rebuked the demons and they fled. Sickness, He spoke to it and it left. These are things that we pray for and we, we're groveling with the Lord like we have no power and no authority. You were given power to speak over the devil and he has to flee. You were given power to speak to a fever and your child's temperature has to go back to 98.6. You were given power that if there's something going on in your body, it's yours. You have authority over Speak to it say... That needs to go away right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't go, Lord, if you could please remove this. I'd really like it gone. He can't do anything about it because he gave you the power. And you are allowing it to just lay there and nothing to happen. <laughs> it's like having a gun in your house and somebody coming to rob your house and you won't pick it up. You have the ability and the power to prevent it, but you won't touch it. And I know some of you are going, oh no, he's talking about guns. Jesus did, I'm sorry. So Jesus said, you know, he was talking about sending you out as sheep among wolves. He said, remember when he, the disciples came back, he goes, when I sent you out and told you not to take anything, did you need anything? They said, no, we didn't lack for anything. He goes, well, now I send you out. Take a purse or a bag. Take money. If you don't have a sword, sell your coat and get a sword. The Word of God. He told them at one point, don't take anything. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to show you my provision. But then he went right back and he told them, now from here on out, you're going to need stuff. So many people take that scripture where you don't need anything and they say, well, we don't need any of this world's filthy lucre. We don't need any of this world stuff. We don't need guns. We don't need any of this. We don't need anything. God will do all of it. That's one scripture. And if you'd have read two more on down, you'd have understood. He said, I'm just showing you what I'm capable of. Now you go out and fulfill it. I gave you power. I gave you authority. So when we're walking in this life, when we're doing the plan and the will of God the way Jesus did, we have power. The prayer of a righteous man really does avail much. When we see stuff, we don't necessarily have to grovel and pray and wish. That's why the word hope has got such a bad rap. The God kind of hope means it's happening. may not be immediate, but it's happening. We're convinced of it. Just like Brother Moore talks about sending that box top off to get his toy in the mail. As soon as he sent it off, he went to the mailbox every day to get that toy because he hoped, he knew, he had faith. They said they would send it if I did this. I did my part. They're going to do their part. It's done. It's just a matter of how long it takes it to go in the mail. It's the same with God. You do your part, He'll do His part. Our part is to avail much. Our part is to speak with authority. Don't let the enemy beat you down and tell you you're not worthy. Don't let him make you think you don't hear from him. How many of you have ever done something and said, oh, I knew that was going to happen? Anybody ever done that? Do you know why? God showed you and the enemy made you believe you didn't hear anything from God. And the moment it happens, you go, ah, I knew that was going to happen. You're working on a motor and you're tightening a bolt and you get it just so tight and something in you says that's tight enough. And you pull it just a little more and it breaks. You go, ah, I knew that was going to happen. You did know that was going to happen. 
the Holy Spirit within you told you the outcome of your next action. You knew it by the Holy Spirit. And the enemy doesn't want you to get used to listening. There's so many times that we'll walk around this building and we'll be doing something and, and we're, we're learning. We still got our pampers on. We're trying to hold them up. We're learning how to hear from God. And we get to this point and we start doing it and we're like, oh, no, no, let's wait. Let's do it this way. And it'll work perfectly. If the image in my head doesn't get carried out just perfectly, it doesn't work. Because that image is from God on exactly how to carry it out. You go through life every minute of the day and God is showing you. He's going ahead of you. His word says he's preparing the way. That means he's made it. He knows what the outcome is and he'll show it to you every step if you'll listen and you'll look. And that's why so many people go, ah, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Oh, I, knew that went, I knew they were going to be closed when we got there. Well, why'd you drive out there? The Lord just told you. It already closed. It's time to turn around and go back to the house. Why? I don't know. The Lord told me it was closed. Well, they're supposed to be open these hours. Doesn't matter. The Lord already told me they're closed. Maybe they got sick. Maybe somebody got hurt. Maybe this. I don't know. But they're already closed. Let's go home. We've got to learn to yield to that voice in us. We've got to learn to, to watch it and to only speak those things. God has a great plan for you. He loves you so much that he laid it out and he runs in your head all the time. You get godly wisdom and godly thoughts every minute of the day. The enemy wants you to cast them down, but God wants you to bring them up and build on them. Glory to God. Would you stand to your feet? There's so many things God wants for His children. If we'll renew our minds, it'll happen. Don't allow somebody to beat you down. Don't allow your friends to talk the other way. We're supposed to, iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to build each other up. I talk about Dan and I uh, quite a bit because... We're bold enough to tell each other when one of us is about to do something dumb. Oh, don't be doing that. That's going to go bad. And, but that's love. The same as your kid's walking over to a hot stove and he's reaching his hand out and you go, honey, honey, don't touch that. You may not be able to get there to physically jerk their hand away, but you would if you could because you know the outcome. The Holy Spirit in you is doing the same thing. Don't, no, don't, 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 don't do that. Oh yeah, go do that. You need to talk to them. You need to build them up. Did you see their face? Something's bothering them. Go back and talk to them. Buy them lunch. Tell them how good God is. Go back, talk to them. Encourage them. Tell them they're doing a great job. Well, yeah, but they missed that. It doesn't matter. Don't focus on the bad. Tell them how great they did everywhere else. That's the plan of God for our life. To build each other up. Because there's power in your words. Glory to God. What are you singing, Sky? Perfect. truly does love us. Amen. <laughs> Brother Sky, can we do I am? Let's switch that to I am what God says I am. And we'll just play it for a minute and then we're going to sing it. Glory to God.
God has a great plan for you. And I really like that song. And, uh, but while he was playing it, when they sang that, what I was seeing was a whole bunch of people going out kind of on cruise control. And I'm not big on cruise control. What I want is for y'all to go out fired up and happy, excited about what we talked about, about there being power in your words, about there being authority in what you say. I want you to go out and I want you to, to part the people in, around and about you with the plan of God for your life. If they're down, I want you to pick them up. If something's bothering them, I want you to have wisdom in your words and fix it and show them that God has a good plan. If there's something in their life that's hurting, I want you to be able to lay hands on them and then be recovered right now because that's who we are. God has a great, great plan. So let's get a little more excited and we're going to sing I Am. says I am. Oh yeah, that's better. I am what God says I am. I'm more than a conqueror through Him who loves me. I am what God says I am. I am. I am what God says I am. But I am as I am, but I'm more than a conqueror through Him that loves me. I am what God says I am. Glory, glory, glory. Altar care workers, come on up. If you're wondering what all of this joy and glory is about, these guys can help you. If you've got questions about your salvation, They've got answers. Glory to God. I'm moving too fast. Would you all just bow your head with me? Affirm or reaffirm our salvation right now. There may be somebody that's too scared to come up, but they can still be saved before they leave this place. Amen? So we're going to take time, and we're going to affirm our faith that they can join with us and become a child of the Most High God. Pray this after me. Dear Lord, I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he paid the full price for all my sin. Jesus, I believe in you. And I ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Holy Spirit, I ask you, guide me and direct me in Jesus' name. Lord, as you help me, I will serve you all of my days. Amen. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but that made me feel better. Isn't it just great to have all of that junk out of the way? Get back to God and His stuff and His plan. There's just a peace there. Glory to God. We'll take your blessed selves and let's go meet the rest of the world and join them. Amen. Glory to God. I am what God says I am. I am what God says I am. But I'm more than a conqueror through Him that loves me. I am what God says I am. I'm blessed. Well, I'm blessed because God says I'm blessed. Well, I'm blessed because God says I'm blessed. Well, I'm more than a conqueror through Him that loves me. I'm blessed because God says I'm blessed. I am blessed. Because God says I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Because God says I'm blessed. I'm more than a conqueror. To Him that love me, I am what God 
Survive.